Okay, hi. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Hello. Salut. Yasas yi te you. The last is Belaru Belarusian. Um, we're going to start, and um, I'm sure that people will be coming in. Um, it uh, has a more of an intimate feel, but I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and uh, I'd like to start by saying to those of you who've heard our introduction a number of times, pretend like you haven't heard it and laugh in all the appropriate places. Um, my name is Sean Bassan, the Commissioner of the Global Art Forum. Um, our team, uh, which is formidable uh, for the, these Dubai days, includes my co-directors on the left, Omar Barada and Ala Yunus. Uh, we also have Uns Katten and Miriam Buti and uh, various protagonists at Art Dubai. This is day five of the forum. Days one and two happened on Saturday and Sunday in Doha at Katara Art Center, and we're grateful to them and QMA for hosting us there. Thank you to our benefactors, Dubai Culture and Arts Authority, and the Arab Fund for Art and Culture uh, for sponsoring the um, Forum Fellows, which is being led by Ted Adzolkada, who some of you may have heard speak um, yesterday evening. Thanks also to Ibraz and Kamal Lazar Foundation for streaming us online and providing us with the means to be bilingual, which reminds me, any of, any of you who want to go English to Arabic, or if we have some Arabic and you want to go to English, we have, um, we have headsets which you can get at the back there. Lastly, the International New York Times is our international media partner. A um, <clears throat> bit of pragmatic housekeeping. Could you please turn your mobile phones to silent at this point? And if you wish to tweet, um, please use the hashtag GAF8. That's GAF8. Thank you very much. Um, so just a, a brief word about what we hope to do generally here at the Global Art Forum. We take pleasure in the modes of thinking, modes of address, and we make this visible. The Global Art Forum is a thought production, an ephemeral salon, and a TV show for people who don't really like television. Um, could we play the first clip, please? enemy of historical continuity and historical memory? Yes, because for one thing, you see, the mechanisms in the past, there are always mechanisms by which uh, the young generation is linked with the older generations. Uh, for instance, uh, Marc Bloch, the, once, great French historian. the great French historian, uh, once pointed out that in actual fact, in agrarian societies, Continuity is maintained by jumping generations. Children are brought up by grandparents because parents go out and live in the fields. And so consequently, children immediately get introduced to what grandparents remember of their past and so on in turn. And that's been broken up in our This centuries. has been broken completely for a variety of reasons. Uh, for one thing, indeed, I mean, the experience of the past is quite often no longer relevant or no longer seems relevant to the younger generation and consequently it becomes something different. The only past uh, which people, very young people, uh, really recognize is their own personal past. The rest is something like olden times. Can you travel in space? I mean, can you travel in time? Well, um we don't. Well, we do travel in time, of course, all the time. We move back and forth in time. And um, I have found that um, there was a man named Dunn, an experiment, or a book called An Experiment with Time, and he found that his dreams consisted not only of the past, but of future events as well. And I have found this to be true since I write my dreams down, and very often I will dream something that then later happens. So in that sense, yes, I think there would be, it's more, uh, it would be easier to travel into the future uh, into, in a real sense than into the past. Meanwhile, history imagines a timeline of transformational turning points, many of which have been lost, forgotten, or erased. 
we, re we realize that there are many timelines and we mark these timelines with personal stories and with, interest, with personal interests. And we are here uh, in, in this edition of GAV, we try to merge as, uh, many of these timelines together and uh, look at these transformational points. The title is Courtesy of Sophie Al Maria. Yesterday, uh, we started with Soviet Orientalism, so we were looking at Soviets and the East in the 1920s in particular. Then we went to Germany and looked at a century of documenta, or at least documenta between 1955 until now and beyond. Then we spoke of pan-Kafirism and Ajamism and various kinds of other ing-isms. And we ended in the 70s. We always tend to end or start or go back to the 70s in the Global Art Forum this year. And we looked at the 70s in Iran, in Greece, and in Chile. Today, we will spend some time in Kuwait. And we will start uh, with the glories and miseries of nation building in Kuwait. And we will also focus afterwards on the so-called confidence interval between 1942 and 1982 in Kuwait after which you will hear all that you've ever wanted to know about CIA and literature. And we will end, and that will be 1966, and we will end with a session which will not focus on a particular date or moment in history, but will focus on what exactly it is that is fascinating about the meanwhile. Thank you, thank you, Omar. So just a, a, a few few words about what else um, the Global Art Forum has um, elicited uh, in the lead up to these days and, and what else is happening around this stage in this room. Um, between the sessions you'll see a number of what we call video postcards. They're commissions by two artists. Uh, the first, uh, you'll always see the, the, the first uh, are in black and white and they're by Raja Khalid. Uh, and they're based around this really fascinating uh, American um, 1950s Cold War um, inspired television program called The Big Picture. Uh, and then after that you will see uh, a, a series of very sort of uh, fractured and frenetic um, homages to Facebook timelines which again to invoke Eric Hodsbaum there seems more and more to be perhaps the histories that matter to us, our, our own personal histories and how we historicize those and also broadcast them. Um, Annabelle Dow um, is, has, has been and today will be making her final set of uh, readings. Um, called, uh, it's a performance called Fortune, which is happening out there. Uh, and the future is literally in your hands. Uh, and then Hin Mizena has made a montage for Meanwhile, Meanwhile, which we'll see at the end of the day. The Forum Forum is a space in front of Hall 1 over in Medina Jumeirah. Uh, it's a media repository and it contains uh, a number of materials, in particular archives of the pre some of the previous editions of the Global Art Forum, uh, the medium of media, and also It Means This. Uh, there are books, uh, Globe books, some of which are outside here, the bright colored little A6 books. Uh, and these commissions that you'll see here today are also uh, also on show. Um, and the other thing that we're doing there is very rapidly archiving uh, the sessions uh, from this week. So if you've, met, if you've for whatever reason, uh, missed any of the sessions and feel like you'd like a catch up, they're available there already in the forum forum space. So at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Allah, who's gonna introduce our first guest. Uh, we genuinely hope you enjoy the day. Okay, the next uh, session is, um, uh, stops in fact in Kuwait or uh, starts uh, two sessions. Uh, two, uh, like we start our day today with Kuwait, and it uh, stops at the years 1959 and 1971, 1977. In the shadow of bigger things is a talk by Sliman Bassam, in which he explores the project of nation building uh, uh, in the time of Kuwait's uh, magical golden era. Uh, Suleiman Bassam is a writer, director, and founder of the Home uh, Theatre in London in, uh, in 1996 and Sabab Theatre, the company's Arabic arm, in 2002 uh, with partner Georgina Van Vile in, yeah, 
Arabic arm, so it can be anywhere. His work, both politically charged and experimental in form, explores contemporary uh, themes of conflict, identity, and culture between the Arab world and the West. His most recent work um, was, com was a commission um, from the Comédie Francaise, Francaise to direct a play by Saad Allah and Nous. Uh, that's going to be the first play by an Arabic author to enter their repertoire. Please join us in welcoming Suleiman Bassam. Thank you, uh, Ala. And thank you to the Global Arts Forum for giving me this opportunity to not only talk today, but um, in fact, the preparation for this talk allowed me to think a little bit differently about some of the themes and concerns that have informed my work as a theatre maker over, particularly over the last uh, 10 or 12 years or so, um, but to think about them in a different way. Um, in considering a reflection on the national history of a small nation state in the Northern Arabian Peninsula, Kuwait, and thinking about how moments in that history articulated and have played out in a way that's affected both the life of that nation and its people, me included, but also in the sense that it contains some sort of perhaps iconic signals around um, development patterns and the ways in which things move, not only in the GCC countries, but even on a, on a wider sort of plane in the MENA region. Certainly those levels of specificity and abstraction have been the, the, the guiding pattern of the way in which I've drawn inspiration myself from uh, the history of Kuwait. Today I'd like to look at um, a few dates the original title, as Allah reminded me, was In the Shadow of Bigger Things. I forgot that and put Ghosts in the Machine, um, which is, I suppose is sort of similar. Um, these are moments that brought about by institutional change that perhaps seemed less significant at the time than they became with the passage of time. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how the contending narratives around identity, what is it to be a Kuwaiti. What is the past of Kuwait? Who is Kuwait? Who are Kuwaitis? Who are the people who live in Kuwait? What's the relationship between having a nationality, being a citizen, and carrying an identity? Um, that sort of triangle, um, which I think is, is sort of central to a lot of the questions facing a, a lot of development projects, also and specifically development projects in the arts and, and the cultural field, because it's really very vital that one has an understanding of one's identity or the identity that one is trying to build when one invests in art and culture, at least. One can think about it like that. So uh, let's start from the independence of Kuwait from the British Mandate 1962. Kuwait, um, what was that thing? Kuwait had a written constitution in 1962 which kind of put it light years ahead of a lot of political systems in the region. It had a uh, university by 1966 that was co-educational. Uh, I found this image on the internet, in fact, and it says up there in Arabic, it's been cropped as Kana, then, that was then. And you see the lines of female students in Kuwait University 1966. It was a mixed campus. Uh, side note, since 1996, the University of Kuwait has no longer been a mixed campus. There are campuses for males, a campus for females. In fact, it's one of the major development projects that's being built in Kuwait, and there is a moat, a lake, in between the male campus and the female campus. Um, but in 1962, things were moving fast, and I think Kuwait was probably a very exciting place to be. Uh, what we had was a, the flowering of a small, rich through its oil income, energetic state. We had flowering in music, flowering in the arts, flowering in theater, and a certain level of freedom of expression that meant that those things could come together in a, in a significant way. And the level of freedom of expression, though um, far attenuated over the, through the passage of time in Kuwait, remains relatively high. 
and I think is an essential component of uh, any creative mandate, any creative project. There's no point investing in the arts unless you are going to allow people to express opinions and not put them in prison for expressing opinions. Um, unless you're prepared to raise the level of speech, civil liberty, and freedom of opinion, there cannot be an arts project. Um, I wanted to show you a little clip, actually, uh, that sort of shows the, the quirkiness there, maybe a little bit of uh, Kuwait. It's a little one and a half minute clip. So how do we do that? I oh, know, just one second, sorry, sorry, before we do that. The one other element that I found, and I've continued to find interesting from that period, this is the manuscript of an Ian Fleming book called State of Excitement. This is the frontispiece of this 1959 book that was commissioned by the Kuwait Oil Company. Ian Fleming, the author of the James Bond novels, was uh, brought to Kuwait in 1959 at the height of his fame to write uh, about what he saw. He wrote a manuscript called State of Excitement. It's the only Ian Fleming novel that you won't be able to find anywhere, unfortunately, um, because it's, uh, it was later banned by the commissioners, the Kuwait Oil Company, for reasons unknown to, to, to myself. I don't know if they're known to others. But there is a copy of this manuscript in the university uh, archives, I believe, in Indiana. Um, so we can have a look, perhaps, at uh, this short clip. Uh, Mr. Semir, please play the clip. This is here in Surrey, an unspoiled English village. The sort of English village you see on the travel posters. And travellers come to see it, and to fill their photograph albums with pictures of Britain's past. And her extraordinary way of life. And the further they come, the more extraordinary it must seem. My name is Ibrahim Bursley. I have come a long way to photograph this English village. My home is very far off in a place called Kuwait. Actually, photography is just a hobby with me. I am here for five years studying building construction. And you'll be using your knowledge back in your own country? Oh, yes. We are building a whole new city in Kuwait. I must go and help. And right here in London is another visitor from Kuwait. My name is Ahmed Ali Dwaid. I have come from Kuwait to study international relations. Cultural relations too, I see. I suppose they're all part of your studies. Well, it happened that I like music. And after all, music is an international thing. I enjoy Italian opera as much as Kuwaiti folk songs. And back in Kuwait, you use your experience for what? I'm going into government service. My name is Brother Hamad Sultan, and I too come from Kuwait. Now I've been in Britain for the past four years studying medicine. Any particular branch of medicine? Well, general medicine at the moment, but eventually I hope to specialize on tropical diseases. Then you'll return to practice in Kuwait? Definitely. At home we are building up a tremendous medical scheme, and I would like to play a part in shaping it. We have great opportunities ahead of us. And here it is, Kuwait, the place you've been hearing about. The place that's growing so fast that by the time you see these pictures, the skyline will have changed again. There we go. So that was a clip from uh, uh, an archive, uh, I mean a film again, that was commissioned, I believe, by a Kuwait oil company and um, gives you an idea of the sort of similarity of horizons, right? You know, this is a city changing so fast, if you come back next month, you won't recognize it. Um, so similar kind of development patterns to some things that we can see elsewhere in, in the GCC region today. But today, 2014, in fact, it was only a few days ago that uh, the populist opposition leader, Musallam al-Barraq, described uh, the state of Kuwait today in a harangue at, uh, at a political meeting. And he described Kuwait as being at its lowest ebb, a country with no light, no future, a country in which social cohesion is torn apart by sectarian tensions, ethnic tensions, social tensions, devoured by corruption, democratic processes twisted and disfigured beyond all recognition. So, Questions of identity have never loomed larger. This is Kuwait today, in fact, yesterday. 
Um, that's uh, the Kipco building and in front are the remains of uh, the, the period that the, that the film <coughs> was talking about that, you, as you can see, is occupied by, uh, uh, probably by immigrant workers who are remaining in these buildings until they're moved out into equally awful 15-story uh, high-rise buildings but on the periphery of town. That movement from the center of uh, the, the, the town to the peripheries is also a movement that, that you can track um, in, uh, in more of the uh, sort of degenerate lifestyles around some of the city dwelling in Kuwait. So <clears throat> it used to be that in the center of Kuwait, not far from where this picture was taken, was the center of uh, music and liquor and prostitution. And with the urban development, those areas that some claim were left inside the center of the city by the British um, in order to kind of keep the peace, but those areas gradually moved further and further out of the city, as indeed are the immigrant workers today being moved further and further out of the city. So how did we get here? What brought us to this? When statist historians, um, and by that I mean <clears throat> people who speak the opinion of uh, the, uh, the official uh, line, if you like, the official line about how Kuwait has reached this point is that Kuwait is a small country um, in the sort of turmoil of regional political, uh, difficult political waters that was given a huge knock by um, the, the Islamic Revolution in 1979 in uh, the Republic of Iran that became a staunch ally of its northern neighbor um, along Sunni lines and then was, of course, devoured by uh, Saddam Hussein and his armies in 1990. And then, so Kuwait is represented as a kind of Switzerland in the middle of this sea of uh, uh, much larger powers that has, is a, has a sort of passive role and is not really able to be either responsible or to be accountable for the state of affairs today. From my point of view as a theater maker, um, that's not a very useful kind of approach to history. Um, I'm interested in the internal factors, the factors that can be within the reach and control of a society and for which, in a sense, responsibility um, can be identified. It's not about naming culprits, but it's about being able to action a, a, a line of thinking that has the possibility of achieving its end, its end being a kind of uh, um, progression or social change. Nonetheless, the golden age, that as it later became to be known, which is Kuwait 60s, Kuwait 70s, remains a very important locus of conflict and tension over questions of authenticity. The liberals use the 60s and 70s to say, look, that's what, that's what culture is, that's what our traditions are, that's what our moors are. We are a port city, we are open to others, we speak Arabic, Swahili, uh, Hindi, that's the nature of this multifaceted society. We are Ajem, we are from uh, Bilad al Furs, uh, we are from the Nejdi Desert, we are a mixed community, and that's the nature of Kuwait. Uh, the other <coughs> school of opinion uses other parts of Kuwaiti history to try to identify the same origins, I mean, or at least the same legitimacy in authenticity, saying, no, 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 we are a conservative society, we are an Islamic society, above all, we are a tribal society, and these are some of the kind of contending narratives um, that we are living through today. I want to discuss one articulating point in history, which I think is important, and, um, and I hope can be a little bit enlightening. It's the nationality laws of 1959. Up until 1959, Kuwaitis uh, um, were recognized one another as Kuwaitis or recent arrivals or non-Kuwaitis. In 1959, this issue was legalized into a law that became a kind of uh, nationality law. In fact, it identified and drew out what it meant and what you had to be in order to be identified as Kuwaitis. This law um, obviously is a step in nation building. Obviously, it's a step in uh, uh, the direction of creating a cohesive uh, social unit out of what was essentially a city-state. But this law also, I believe, in its fundamental makeup, made the whole relationship between nationality, citizenship, and identity into a diabolic triangle. If we look into um, the law itself, you'll see here I've managed to find some of the 
um, nationality papers of uh, uh, different individuals. The first one here is nationality Kuwaiti first degree. The one over there is nationality Kuwaiti fifth degree. And the one down here is eighth, seventh, ninth, ninth, ninth degree. So, degrees. What are these degrees? Well, there are, I think that's you. And I'm going to talk to you about eight. So if there's a ninth, then, then that's a discovery. Right? Uh, I'll just give you a quick overview of what makes diff these different degrees. Right? So first degree, Kuwaiti Daraja Ule, residence in Kuwait before 1920. Why 1920? Inside the law is another ghost, another story, another history. 1920 is the year of the wall. It was the year that Kuwait became a walled city. The wall was made to defend Kuwait against the attacking uh, Ikhwan armies of Abdul Aziz bin Saud. It was also the year of the Battle of Jahra. And uh, the Battle of Jahra, the Ikhwani warriors came on their horses into Kuwait. There were, I think, three to 4,000 of them. And a number of the Kuwaiti army and residents who'd made a kind of popular army were surrounded in the uh, Red Fort in Jahra. After a two, I think, days of battle, a truce was called, and an emissary of the Akhwan came with a message to the Kuwaitis. And I'm going to quote from Mendil bin Ghnayman. Uh, Mendil ibn Ghnayman. So Mendil ibn, ibn Ghnayman's message to the rulers of Kuwait was that you need to do five things and we'll leave you alone. You need to make the Turks, the Ottomans, into heretics, takfir al-atraq. You need to abolish smoking, munkar, and prostitutes. Kuwait was famous for smoking, titin, uh, munkar, and prostitutes. In fact, there was a great business that was done for many years um, by uh, smugglers of titin, tobacco, uh, Kuwaiti smugglers of tobacco who, who smuggled uh, into Saudi Arabia and became very rich. The third rule was the eviction of the Shia. We don't want the Shia in Kuwait. The Shia that are in Kuwait have to go out. The fourth demand was the destruction of the American hospital and the deportation of its doctors. Now, the American hospital was established by missionaries. So for the Juan, there was already an ideological problem with the, with, with the, the, the nurses and so on. I mean, the nurses, you know, the doctors. <laughs> and the adoption of the Juan doctrine. Now, for those of you not familiar with the history of the region, the Ikhwan doctrine is not to be confused with the Ikhwan doctrine of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is a separate organization. The Ikhwan were the, were the warriors of Abdul Aziz bin Saud. They were not uh, Hassan al-Benna's guys and all that. So, that was the first degree. The first degree was l sort of seeded in 1920, so a history within a history there. Those that were not part of the walled city in 1920 were not regarded in 1959 as being the original Kuwaitis. Second degree, their children. So by law, anybody who's the son or daughter of a first degree becomes a second degree. Um, third degree is a child born of a Kuwaiti mother from an unidentified father. So the father is unidentified, but the child is born of a Kuwaiti mother. She doesn't, she doesn't know who the father is, or it's a foundling, a waif, or an abandoned child who is found on the street with no mother or father becomes third degree Kuwaiti. هذا اللي يسمونه يعني نغل طبعا يعني النغل بالمفهوم هذا is that the mother is that the, the, the mother is somehow um, a better pedigree. Fourth degree, Arabs who have resided in Kuwait 15 years or more, or foreigners over 20 years. I mean, fourth degree, this, this one for Arabs residing in Kuwait has hardly ever, to my knowledge, been used. I mean, the, the ones for, uh, you know, great Arabs who've lived in Kuwait for a long time, no, hardly ever been used. Fifth degree, child born of a Kuwaiti mother and foreign father issued upon divorce. So if you are a, a Kuwaiti woman married to a foreign man, you have to divorce the man in order for your child to have fifth degree. Fifth degree is also for those of recipients of great services, services rendered to the state. And um, I mean, that has not been activated enough in the history of Kuwait. I mean, it's mostly bequeathed upon cooks and drivers of powerful people. Sixth degree, there is no sixth degree. 
Seventh degree, children and wives of fifth degree. Eighth degree, foreign wives of Kuwaitis after five years. Right. So they all have the same legal and social rights, once they are Kuwaitis. However, they don't enjoy the same political rights. And only first and second degree Kuwaitis have the right to vote or stand for parliament. So we can see. From the very basis, inception of this law, a schism is created. A psychic boundary is drawn in the national identity of Kuwaitis. There's a distinction drawn between you were before or you were after. Oh, goodness. Sorry. The final thing that this law created was a very sort of small problem at the time that over time became a big problem. And this is you know, an example of these institutional changes that over time and with the passage uh, and with the growth in demography become huge uh, vectors for, for issues or problems, or, which was the problem of the Bidun. So when the 1959 uh, law of nationality institutionalized what it meant to be Kuwaitis, there were inevitably people who were left outside of the census, people who were inevitably not counted. And then they did a recount in 1965, and still there were people who were not counted. At that time, the, the numbers were estimated to be around 7,000 people. Those 7,000 people, their cases were studied over and over and over and over again. And 10 years later, 70,000 people had been nationalized um, um, on the basis of this unresolved issue. So clearly, the Bidun issue has not only created a big social problem in Kuwait. Today, the official numbers of the Bidouns is around 200,000. These are people without uh, uh, nationalities, as it were. But the, 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 it's also been used, the Bidun issue has also been used as a smokescreen for the nationalization, the politically motivated nationalization of tribal parties and others in order to alter the democratic process of Kuwait. Kuwait was, um, singular in its courage at adopting the, uh, a, a, a democratic process for, litigate, for, for the, the passage of executive laws in parliament. And part of the transformation that comes out of the, the nationality law, the creation of the, the bidouns and so on, and the movement and the retransformation of Kuwaiti society through politically motivated nationalization. So rulers would nationalize en masse people who would become Kuwaiti overnight in order to have their votes at the next round of parliament. Um, well, this is difficult because I've sort of talked myself into a corner. Sorry, I haven't given this talk before. I've run out of time, and I'm only sort of a third of the way through. So, mm. Mm. any ideas? No, um, no, 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 because my colleagues uh, also have some very interesting material that I want them to show. Um, uh, yes? Our suggestion yes. would be to actually invite you onto the next uh, part of the discussion panel, and the, some, of the, some of the remaining Yes, yes, okay. Well, look, my apologies, because when I'd written this down as notes, I didn't realize that it would take me so long and that I would speak so much in order to try to get these ideas across. So we will um, wrap it up there. And as they say, uh, maybe to be continued. Thank you very much. Thank you.